Alrighty, we are live at the Vine. Good to see everybody. Um, we're going to angle it up just a little bit, please. Big country dad on there. Shabbat Shalom, brother. Good to see you from this morning. Perfect. And anybody else on there, give us a little shout out right now. Shalom to everybody. Shalom. We are going to be in Leviticus so, oh, chapter 14 and 15 today. <laughs> Levitakis. <laughs> As we get everything kind of set up here. All right. Hello there, Amelia. Tyler Porter. Good to see you as always. Blessed one who's right next to me. Uh, and the freak who's known as Nick the Freak Freeman to no my neck, left. Nick. No neck Nick to my left. Here's Marsha. Miss Cleveland, good to see you guys again. Shalom, shalom. All right, Jonathan, let's go ahead and get started with some prayer. All right, let's. Oh, Zoom, I didn't mute. Okay, got you back. Thank you, Robert. Okay, let's pray. Dude, thank you for today. Thank you for your Shabbat. Thank you for um, the blessing that you promised us for uh, being available and taking this day aside, and making it like no other day that we do not work. Uh, that we honor you and what we do and what we say, that we gather together as your command state. So I just thank you for this day. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for this study. I just pray that uh, we, we leave here just a little bit better than when we got here. I just pray that Son's holy name be glorified and magnified. I pray that in his name. Amen. 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 Nick, will you grab that, please? Okay. Yeah. So, Joe, what chapters are we reading today? Today we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 14 and 15, short short tour portion this week. 14 and 15. 14 and 15, yeah. Okay. I mean, 14 is a little long. It's got 57 verses. 15 has got 33. Okay. But we are still talking about uh, uncleanliness. Yeah, all, all the different ways and all the different reasons. Yep. From the big toe to the top of your head. <laughs> <laughs> Which Liter is funny, that was literally, the, the cleansing was what the ear, the top of yep. the head, all the way down to the toe. Okay. Yep, so. from your head down to your feet. <laughs> Don't make a feet. Yep, that's it. <laughs> you know, what's where that scripture at? Cleanliness is next, you know, godliness. I mean, what is that in uh, second Hezekiah? Second Hezekiah, yeah, yeah. I think it's chapter six, <laughs> chapter six, yeah. <laughs> Just get uh, online. Don't go Google that. Yeah, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's not biblical, but uh, the, that's in the book of Joe Christmas. <laughs> right, right. But anyway, so, money. as we started, like Joe said, as we started in 14, you know, this is a follow-up chapter to last week. So if you did miss last week's, um, we went through in some detail over leprosy and what about leprosy and how it comes about and that it's not just a singular issue. It's, it's any kind of skin disease or skin problem that can be at least somewhat visible. So an external um, disease. So this one is going to be a follow-up to last week's. We're going to actually talk about some of the laws and what to do and how to do it. Before it was more of the inspection and the what is it and how is it and where does it come from. But now we're going to start looking into the all the, the nitty-gritty and, and more of the uh, direction we're going to take with the information that we had from last week. There you go. Now, Shabbat Shalom, Debbie Avery. Uh, missing you today. Uh, Bob Cleveland, if I hadn't already said it. Shalom, shalom. Yeah, so <clears throat> when I'm reading through these portions again, what I'm seeing is, is how important these things are. Mm -hmm. Because just like we just went through all these other chapters and, and the past portions on the temple and or on the tabernacle, I'm sorry, and on the linens and the gold and the visions and the people who were given the ability to make these things and all the way to the priests and how the priests are to conduct themselves. And you see this big, it's nothing but order. Right. Our God is a God of order. And even to hear you saying, hey, look, you've got a lot of people living in close, close proximity to each other. So we can't, we have to be very careful with this because uh, let's just say, you know, I know the number varies on the amount of people who lived uh, or came out of uh, Mitzrayim, Egypt at that time. Let's say it is 1.6 million people. Can you imagine camping, camping? With 1.6 million people, it's the largest Sakota in the world. No, because you got to remember, you've got cities that are 1.6 million people, and they have to be on top of each other in, in high rises and stuff like that. 
So to have a single dwelling spread of 1.6 <laughs> million people would be insane. Yeah. That's tough too. Yeah, can you – well, when you think about this, all the way – he's giving them instructions all the way from, hey, if you got something on your skin, go to priest. Yeah. Let's just make sure this isn't more of an issue than what it is. And if it is an issue, we need to take care of it. Yeah. Um, he even gives them instructions in here on when they go to the bathroom. Hey, go take get your shovel. Right. Go over here. And, and God said the reason why is he says <clears> – <throat> excuse me. The father says – I walk in the camp. Mm -hmm. I am in the camp amongst you. So don't don't leave your, you know, your business yeah. out all over yeah, the place. Right. Don't be yucky. Yeah, don't be yucky. Let's let's be clean. Let's be thoughtful. Let's you know let's let's make sure we're not causing an un unnecessary spread of disease, because with such a close proximity to each other, mm -hmm. all it would take is an outbreak of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then once it starts going, is that's that's you know someone's like that's your work. That's your wrap. Yeah. yeah. Nick would say that's a wrap. <laughs> So as we're going into 14 and 15, we're seeing that he's, you know, he's being very specific again. He's, you know, he's talking about the sprinkling um, of the blood. He's talking about the touching the priest. In verse 16, it says, the priest shall dip his right finger into the oil that is on his left hand and shall sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before Jehovah. And the rest of the oil in his hand, the priest puts some on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot on the on the blood of the guilt offering and the rest of the, of the all that is in the priest's hand and puts it on the head of him who is to be cleansed and the priest shall make atonement for him before Jehovah. So one of the things we talked about a little bit, I think it was our, our men's study on Thursday was we kind of uh, went back and said, you know, there's pro there, there seems to be an issue not only with, hey, you got a white spot on your arm. You got a, you got a funny looking mole on you. You need to get it checked out. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> This is going into, hey, there might be some type of sin in your life that needs to be dealt with. Right. And it's manifesting on the body itself. Yeah. So when you're coming to the priest here and you're getting cleansed, it's also making atonement for you. So maybe this is one of those times where the guy, where you come to the priest, you know what? I done messed up. I did this, blah, blah, blah. I haven't quite been doing things the way I should be doing. And so then there's an atonement made uh, for this person and they're cleansed from whatever. And I know that they're using the word leprosy here, but it's not necessarily meaning the one where your fingers are falling off and you're yeah. going to die from losing yeah. limbs. Yeah. This is a uh, skin condition. I think is more closely connected to the speaking of something that's not right, the speaking against authority, the speaking or saying something that's, you know, it's just not uplifting to someone else. So I think within this, what I don't want us to miss is the spiritual application of what's taking place as much as we may look at it and go, oh, it's just, they had some zits, they had some warts, they had some whatever, they had some psoriasis. white, you know, they had some psoriasis, they had whatever. And I think if we just think of it that way, then we're missing the spiritual aspect of, of this as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think another one is uh, like a burn. I know we kind of forget about certain stuff that can happen, like a cut, a burn, a scar. You know, there's all these things that can get kind of ugly if you can get infected. And it's not necessarily leprosy. It's just, it got ugly. Yeah, you, know, you got infected. You got um, you get you you got a scar. You went in salt water and it started bubbling up, getting all weird looking. You know, and it's like, oh, okay, hey, just give me a minute. You know, let let it heal. Let it do it natural. Let's take a natural course. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what's interesting is I actually wanted to start right at the beginning and read this um, beginning couple of verses. It's, yeah, it says, <clears throat> the Lord spoke to Moses saying, "This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing." So, you know, it's given us a pretty specific law. That's a, that's a word of saying instruction. This is what to do mm -hmm. on the day of cleansing. So um, if this is a specific time period. It says, he shall be brought to the priest. So we know that this is a priest action that's happening. This isn't a, a doctor or an everyday person. This is for the priest. Mm -hmm. And the priest shall go out of the camp. And the priest shall look. So I'll stop there. Here, what we're saying is the priest is leaving to go meet the people. And I think one of the things that we we in our modern world what we've seen as priests and pastor and all these like leadership positions is the people have to come to them. Oh, if you want to go to healing, you need to go to the prophet. Oh, you need a demon cast it out. You got to go to this guy. And here it's saying, no, no, no. The priest, the guy that God established to be in charge of the instructions, he goes out to the people and he goes out of outside of the camp. He's like, we, you're unclean. How did you? How did we think they got in there to get checked on? They didn't. The priest had to go out to them mm -hmm. to go get <clears throat> And that's something that, you know, I've gone through these studies a few times now. And that the detail that really seems to be missing and lacking, it's always, oh, well, you go before the priest. Well, Yeshua didn't send that leprous guy to the priest until after he was cleansed. That guy didn't just show up there. When, you, when Yeshua 
uh, healed those 10 guys, they were outside the camp. And Yeshua went to them. And he went to them, exactly. So mm -hmm. he's setting up and he's giving us the perfect example of all this story. And it's a really like kind of minor detail. It's just kind of sprinkled in at the beginning of the chapter. But it's like the priest leaves his position and his role of sitting high and mighty, as we would look at it today, as the Pharisees were doing. Oh, I get the special seat and I got the long seat seats and I get the special treatment. No, no, no. You're a Pharisee. You go out to the people that need they need you. Yeah, you're supposed to be a servant. Exactly. Above so all else. We, we've changed and adjusted the role so much that our leadership, our pastors, our community leaders, you know, they they're there's an expectation that they're out in the community. They're, they're involved in putting their hands in different people's lives. And I know like old school pastors, they used to do like home visits. Right. And they would go and say, Hey, I'm gonna come over your house on Wednesday. You know, you make him a nice meal and you know, you're appreciative of him coming out to you, but it really was. So he could be involved in your lives. Cause it says the people will know the shepherd's voice. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't ever go to church, if you don't have a shepherd, if you don't know who that person is, that's going to be an area where you're missing and lacking. And, I, and I, I'm not saying for everybody who's online, that if you don't have that option, you know, that you're doing wrong. But when you do, you know, that pastor should kind of be that kind of guy. And that congregation member should be that kind of person. And um, I just think it was really, really cool this time going through it. The priest left his role. He left his temple seat. He left his uh, tabernacle seat to go out and find these guys and help them, minister to them, make sure they can get cleansed as soon as possible. And we're going to go check. Are you good now? No, I'll be back next week. Let's hope you're good because I want you back in the fold as soon as possible. Not, we'll send you out and when we, when we feel like it, we'll come check on you. So I just want to see where you guys thought of with that conversation and kind of go through that a little bit. I would have a question with the, um, the priest disciples. I'd have to have a certain uh, group of priests for this these two-week period or however that worked out. Mm -hmm. Are there extra priests that would go do this checking? Because that's, I think, my understanding is that the priestly cycle, they would be staying at the temple and tabernacle. Yeah, there's, right, there's, right. There's for sure different roles. And yeah. the extra priests outside of that, mm -hmm. the ones who are off of the cycle. Right. Yeah, right. I think I would agree with that. Yeah. I'm trying to remember if it was, um, you guys online helped me out with this. I want to say, I, I believe it, it was part of the priesthood that there was supposed to have been uh, one one priest per <clears throat> either 10 or one priest per 100 people mm. that would serve that you know specific group so um so this we're not talking about this you know 20 guys mm -hmm. working in the tabernacle yeah. this is like a, a large group of men that are you know doing it you know they have, they have a lot to do it's a very mm -hmm. very busy job yep. so if anybody remembers that let me know um <clears throat> so we got Trevor Shabbat Shalom. We got Robert Johnson Shalom. If I missed anybody else, I apologize. Uh, shalom to you. So uh, yeah, the, the the roles of the priests were very. I think you had those who were working the temple that were doing the the you know the slaughtering. They were doing the doing everything they were supposed to have been doing at the time. And then you had those I think that were trained to hey, you need this group here, you're going to go out there, you're going to you know see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Now, I like the fact you brought when Yeshua we read in Luke 17. I think that's where it was, Luke 17 in our men's study. It says that Jesus went into the village where 10 lepers were. Mm -hmm. And it says, and they ran to him. They're like, Master, you know, please have mercy on us, you know. So you see Christ setting an example where he, they can't really go anywhere. And if someone's in a situation as bad, they already know, hey, there's a possibility I'm unclean. So I can't even go near the tabernacle. I can't even get through the gate to see these guys. I really need them to come to me. Mm -hmm. So, so as an example, I love I love the fact that Yeshua shows us the same thing. Because then, then at the end of that story, remember he says, "Hey, y'all go your way, show yourself to the priest, and on the way they were made clean." Clean. Yeah. So, well, beautiful I think, story. I think what else too is we're seeing like that it, you know as we continue reading in three, it says, "And the priest shall look." So the priest went out and he did his job. Then, so it's an if then statement. Then, if the case of the leprous disease is healed. So good job, guys. Better um, is healed in the leprous person. The priest shall command. So now we're going to get a directive, command them to take for him <clears throat> who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and go, go through the process. So he's saying, hey, I checked you. You're good. Now you can come in. But the coming in process involves these details. So, you know, how important we, we talk about all oh, the law was kind of iffy and, you know, wishy-washy. And, well, they were coming out of Egypt and they picked up this and they picked up that. Well, here it's like, uh, if you want to come back, you have to do this stuff. I'm pretty sure in their minds they weren't like, 
I mean, maybe I'll do it or maybe I won't. You know, I might show up. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of not <laughs> a big deal. I feel like it. I'm it, busy. <laughs> exactly. And, and there's so much of, you know, the way we look at the, the Torah today is it's up to interpretation. It's how we feel. But I don't think these guys thought that. They were like, you need me to do what? And two birds, some blood, a stick, a branch, a oil. I got you. You know, let me bring extra just in case because I, I want to come back. I want to be in the fold. And that's essentially what sin is in our lives, you know, outside of leprosy, just regular old day, day-to-day sin. We come to the Father and say, I've messed up. It's my fault. You come inspect me. You come check my heart and see if I'm good today. And now what is your what is your instruction? To repent, turn from your ways, follow the path of righteousness. It's the exact same thing, doing the right thing. The priest told him, do the right thing, bring these ingredients, bring these items. And Yeshua is now, the Father's telling us, do these right things so we can be back in a relationship because it's the sin that's separating us. So this is a mm-hmm. huge example of like a, a leprosy issue. But how it applies so much in a grand scale of like the, the picture of it of God and Yeshua have never changed any of the rules or expectations or concepts, just some of the details along the way. We no longer have to go to a priest and bring blood on a stick and get oil on our ear, but we can go to the Father boldly because of what Yeshua did. And so because he is our high priest, where we I'm not gonna say skip the line, but we get to go straight to the Father uh, because of that. So I think there's a lot of really cool stuff just in like three or four verses there. Mm-hmm. The Reverend Luke 17 and how Yeshua went into the camp of the ten lepers, uh, or at least there was ten there. Um, is that showing that the priests at the time were not doing their job and going out to them? I mean, I know it's not definitive, but at least it's like a hint. I would say no, because they still had leprosy when he showed up. Yep. So he, he they would have come to check, but oh, you still have leprosy, and then I go back home. But if he, he came to check, they saw leverage. Says, I'll fix the problem. I'm not going to just check on you. I'm going to fix it. And he said, now that you're fixed, I'm also checking on you. Yeah. You're good, right? Go to the priest. Go handle yeah. your business. Say, thank you, please. Oh, I know I could be reading into it, um, but reading Luke 17, I don't know, it just kind of seems like they had maybe been there for longer than you know, they really needed to be you know, uh, set apart from the rest of the people. As long as it's not leprosy, they had to stay. Right. So I just meant the priest coming and checking yeah, yeah. and, and uh, trying to get them clean and doing the right process. Well, at that time, the system was broken. broken. So I'm sure it was not being handled appropriately and correctly. Sure. That's my assumption. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I want to say in, in uh, John chapter uh, 10, verse 9, it says, I am the door. Other translations will say, I am the gate. Mm. It says whoever enters through me shall be saved and shall go in and shall go 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 out and find uh pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to slaughter and destroy. And I have come that they might possess life and that they might possess it beyond measure. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And so in here, and I was it was making me think about when you're talking about the priest and how these people could not come to they couldn't come to the tabernacle because they're unclean. Mm-hmm. Christ is saying, I shall make you clean. I am the good shepherd. I am the one who's at the gate. And it's like, and the only way you're entering in, because when you come to me, you're going to be dirty. Mm-hmm. And the only way you're going to enter into where I want you to get to is, is through me, is through his cleansing of us that makes us righteous, that we can enter into the good the good place mm-hmm. where the good pastures are. And so we see the example again with the priests. When the priests are coming to them, it's like, hey, the way that you get back into fellowship with the people, the way you come back to their tabernacle is going to be through this process. And so for them to be cleansed. So you can't, if you're, if you're dirty, you can't get in. That's yeah. it, period. Yeah. It's just like we had that story of the two that were doing the bad stuff in front of the, front of the tabernacle and Phineas had to go over there and put a spear through both of them. That's a no, no, we don't do that. So they already know that we can't show up as we are. I, I, I have to be cleansed. Mm-hmm. And so Yeshua is saying, I am the gate. I'm the good shepherd. And the only way you're going to get in is because my cleansing over you is going to allow you to come in. And the thief and the robbers and everybody else, I already know who they are, and they're not coming in. But those who call upon his name, upon the name of our Father Jehovah, shall be saved. All right, what else we got, guys? Uh, so 33 on to the end, this, you know, this is where it kind of shifts from the leprosy talk, the, the yucky skin. Um, it starts talking about your houses. And again, like I said, I, I'm this year, for whatever reason, I started kind of seeing more of the analogy aspect of it. Like for them at the time, this was a direct command. Hey, if your house is messed up, we got to take care of it. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and this was a, but that's because we had 1.6 or one point, whatever. We had yep. a lot of people. A lot of people. If your house is messed up, that's going to spread. If you're, out, if you're getting sick, you're going to get other people sick. We need to make sure we keep the camp clean and the people safe and protected so we can make it to the other side, right? So we can be Hebrews. So we're not stuck over here in Egypt or, or dead in the desert, which unfortunately some of them didn't make it, <clears throat> all of them. So um, whenever you look at the, uh, the instructions, they're there for a purpose and they're there intentionally. But when we look at it, like I said, from today's perspective, this was written for them. But then we can't just say, oh, this was a good Levitical law. Next page. You know, that these people are all dead and gone. These rules are all dead and gone. What is it about in today's world where we take the uh, the instruction? Where, where, what's about our house? What about our situation? Right. We read in Joshua, as for me and my house will serve the Lord. If you have areas or uh, sections of your life where you're saying, ah, I'm not choosing this day who I'm going to serve. I'm choosing the bad guy. I'm choosing my own ways. I'm choosing the flesh. You got to do some house cleaning. You got to go mm -hmm. in and say, inspect. Like how we just did with the leaven. Go around and check. Hey, do I have any leaven in my house? Do I have any leaven in myself? That's the ultimate goal. Is yeah, these are word pictures and these are meant to be like representative. And, and it's true. We really don't want you to have any leaven, but also it was meant for you to start thinking about the small issues. The leaven's microscopic. Mold is similar. You know, it can start off just as a spore. They're saying, go and check for that little bitty stuff. Go and find the little problem. A little problem today is a big problem in the future. Um, well, you know, they, they said if they, they found it, you burn the house. Now you chip off the, the stuff. If it comes back, you got to destroy it. So, oh, well, I mean, it was a nice house. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But next, <laughs> move on. So it's very, very um, appropriate to our world today, mm -hmm. even though it sounds like old school Levitical stuff where they're busting up clay pots and trying to burn stuff because it was uh, – had a, a fly died in it. It was like, yeah, yeah. But look at it today, and how do we apply it today? It's so exact that it's almost eerie. There's almost some irony of like, hey, you were writing to them in their houses, but somehow this applies today, almost perfectly. Yeah, I think you know, as far as like contaminations, what do we do today? And we don't necessarily make something burn things. Burn it down. Throw it away. We throw it away. <laughs> Mm -hmm. they dispose it. Yeah. <laughs> purging it, we're getting rid of yeah, it. Yeah. Right. Same thing like the leprosy clothes. Remember, I said it was thick. If you get the yuck on your clothes, burn it. Get it out of here. Right. We just have disposable band aids. So we put it in a plastic baggie and send it away. But they were just like, we don't have a send it away place. There's no garbage truck that shows up. Right. right. We got to <clears throat> remove it. You know, one of the things, too, that in our modern times that we have to deal with it in homes, unfortunately, is when someone has a mold issue. Yep. And it, can, it, and it can be within the walls. You don't actually see it. But then all of a sudden, people start getting sick. They have breathing issues. I mean, it's actually killed people with having mold in your home. And so we see that uh, even in our modern days, our modern times with, you know, our modern homes, that if you get mold inside there, it can be very deadly for you. So you mm -hmm. can see this kind of playing out here where it's like, uh, we need to nip this in the bud now. We need, right. to, we need to get this out, uh, out of your homes. But yeah, one of the most costly, uh, other than termite damage, uh, I think mold. I don't know which one's more. So I'm gonna assume it's termites. But having mold uh, in someone's home and having to rip out the walls, redo things, mm -hmm. is a, a one of the most highest costly things for insurance companies. Right. Yeah, so in verse 39, it says, and the priest shall come again. So, right, this priest that we were talking about earlier who's out, this priest shall come to the house. So the priest is not, again, off his shiny seat or wherever, how we look at it today. They're out in the community. He's out. Hey, let me go check on your house. What's the, what's the deal? All right, so in 39, it says, the priest shall come again on the seventh day. And look, if the disease has spread, meaning it is now multiplying, it has gotten worse, um, on the walls of the house, then the priest shall command. That's an instruction directly from the priest, uh, from the priest, because he received it from God, that they take out the stones in which the disease and throw them into an unclean place outside the city. So you know, if you're building your house on bricks and that brick starts getting bad, that stone starts getting bad, he's like, just remove the entirety of it. Don't try to chip it off. Don't try to bleach it and scrub. He's like, take it out because once you get a disease, once you have an issue. You, you got to remove it. And, you know, Yeshua later tells us about the, uh, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out of your arm, cut it off. And that, not literally right in our in our actual anatomy because God created us to be this way. But he said that's how serious it is. You need to remove it completely. And so he's saying this is an, an example of if you're if that one rock 
just get rid of the rock and then replace it with a good rock and then you should be good but we're going to go keep double checking because we always need those small tune refinements and so even in this situation you're looking at small tune refinements um like that i also think that whenever it talks about the rocks uh think about like who's in your house and it's your friends and your family so if you have a person who is toxic to you in your and they refuse to change and they refuse to not be toxic then that stone needs to be removed and it needs to be replaced with somebody who is not toxic mm -hmm. anything from youtube yeah kyle i put in here uh let's see kyle said it makes me kind of makes me wonder if the priest had memorized the book of healing that seems to have disappeared that would be nice to still have that book um, if it was there. And then he said, um, he said the Pharisees didn't seem to be surprised with healing. They just didn't want it done on Sabbath. Um, you know, <clears throat> I saw that, Kyle. I was just, uh, me personally, I believe that their hearts were so hardened um, and so blinded to seeing Messiah that even though there was a miracle literally done right in front of their faces, they, were, they weren't willing to repent. If you, if this guy is saying, I'm the son of God, and I'm walking in all this authority, demons are fleeing from me, people are coming back from the dead, the guy with the withered hand on Shabbat all of a sudden is made whole, all these things are happening. This tells me that they were truly, not all of them, but they were truly in a wicked place where their eyes were being blinded. And, prideful. and very prideful. Uh, I think it was partly because Jesus wasn't part of their... Like right. If it was their people doing it, granted they may have had an issue with it being done. Well, you know, what's well, funny you say that because I think uh, mm -hmm. it's in Luke also a few chapters before when we were doing our men's study. One of the Pharisees in, in, uh, asked Jesus to come to his house. Hey, come on, let's let's talk. Mm -hmm. It almost felt like it was like, hey, <clears throat> I want you to be one of the boys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then right after that, we get a list of woes this mm -hmm. long. Jesus is like, I'm not going to be your boy. And by the way, woe unto you. And he gives him this long list of woes. Then the scribes are like, but what about us? You too. Woe to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you see that their heart was not, and not all of them, because we have Nicodemus, we have Joseph of Arimathea. We, we have different examples of, because even with Nicodemus, he says, he's, he's, he's referring back to a group of guys. We know that God sent you. Mm -hmm. But it's again, it's in the cover of the night because he doesn't want to get busted. He knows that the main the main part of this problem is the system again is broken. And if they find out, there goes my way of life, goes his way of life. It might even get thrown in jail. We don't know. And so uh with Robert Johnson, he says, Kyle, I certainly think Yeshua wants the Pharisees to re, re, uh, reconsider labor of love, but also they could have been healers. For money or aware of that practice which would be working for money on the sabbath hmm. so who knows i mean it's you know and the other thing we have to remember too guys is that you know there's another reason why when they they claim that yeshua is casting out demons in beelzebub is because black magic or, or dark magic was used to control demons or supposedly control demons and it was a form of uh uh, getting demons out of people or whatever you want to say. So it wasn't done by the authority of God. It was done by witchcraft. Right. So when they see him doing this, they're still so blinded. They don't realize, no, I'm doing this in the authority through the Holy Spirit is given to me by my Heavenly Father. Oh, apparently he's doing it because we've seen this before. He's doing it under this guy. And Jesus is like, oh, no, 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 no. By the way, Satan ain't my father. He might be yours, <laughs> but he ain't mine. And so, you know, again, these guys are so blinded to the truth that they can't even see it when it's right in front of them. All right, guys, anything on 15? Let's move in there. This was 15 is pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, a lot of this has to deal with their time and you know, as far as a, a woman with the issue of, of her time of the month for uh, marital relations to, you know, all these different things are being covered in 15. Mm -hmm. And so basically, again, this is going back to some of this should be common sense. Hey, if you do this, then you got your unclean to leave me or you may be seven days from now. You know, it all depends. So it's not, so unclean, does that mean they sin? No, not necessarily. No, 
Look at but they're unclean, Joe. That's a really bad I thing. Know, right? I know, right? <laughs> a pig's unclean, but he's not sin. <laughs> <laughs> Only when you eat it. <laughs> so I think I think that's like you know one of the things. At least if we can kind of get some of this information out and kind of start to look at the scriptures a little more, what the intent behind it was. You know, when when the Bible tells you that you're unclean, that's just like you need to take a bath. You know, right. we, we kind of know what unclean is. If you were out working all day on a car and you're covered in grease and, and dirt, you're unclean. Well, the last thing you need to do is walk in the kitchen and start making meatloaf with your hands. Exactly, <laughs> right. Or start touching all the white towels. Right. You're, you're not clean. And it, the wife it, would not like that. Exactly. <laughs> the mo- not the monogram towels. But we, we understand that super logically in today's world of, hey, my hands are dirty, my body's dirty, I'm covered in sweat, whatever it is. We know oh, I should get clean before I go out to dinner. I should get clean before I go to church or what, whatever, right? Whatever your event, hey, I'm going to go to work tomorrow. I smell like the field. Maybe I shouldn't smell like the field so I can go to the office. And that's just a real, just honest, like almost like a duh moment. But yet when we read scripture, we're like, oh, unclean. That means sin. This is some terrible, unhuman thing. It's like, no, no, no. You're supposed to have marital relations just because now you are not allowed to go and sit at the temple or the, the tabernacle. Right. That's the, that's that's the only caveat. It's it's not saying that you sinned, you've done something wrong, you're dirty, yucky, icky, n- none of that kind of stuff. You just hey, go take your bath, go get clean, show up tomorrow. And that that's a real easy concept for us to understand. I mean, I think we all know when stuff's happening and all the situations Joe brought up, generally there's some cleaning involved, either a bath or a yeah. something. You know, yeah. you just don't walk around in your own mess. So um, well, we, we hope not. <laughs> right, exactly. On, on average, people yeah. people know how to get clean, and, and in today's world, it's a lot more easy, a lot simpler, a lot easier. All those words. You yeah, know, we, we have we have easy. a shower, we have you know disposable items. So uh, our world today is actually really easy to make sure we keep the cleanliness laws. Back then, it was you have to go find some running water. Well, what if you're in the middle of the desert? And it's not. Well, what do you do? You know, there's there's a lot more right. nuances to these rules. Where today, it's like we all. Or probably I'll have a shower or a bath right. or a hose <laughs> or something. So we can we can turn around and get clean like immediately and we're good. You know, I said, but you know, just wait your time period. So I, th- I think it's it's interesting that it goes through so much detail because it is important. And God's like, hey, I just want to keep my people clean and happy and healthy. Don't come in the tabernacle wearing all your super cool stuff and you got motor grease on you. You know, like just clean yourself up first. And I think that should be slightly logical. Oh, absolutely. Um Thank you, Miss Cleveland, for looking. She said, uh, FYI, I could not find in Torah where the ratio of priests to people is established. It may be somewhere else within the uh, prophets or somewhere. I, I thought it may have been just what we were just told at one point. It may not even be, you know what I mean? It's one of those things where you think it's in the scripture, but it's not. It could have been just, you know, this is how they did things. So um, I have no idea on that one. So I just remember hearing something like that. There was a ratio, but um going back to what you're saying jonathan with that it's like you know it's like common sense it's like hey if if you're dirty clean yourself right and so one of the things i kind of see with this too and you're kind of like why like some of this should some of this the majority of people you think should know mm-hmm. but what we found out is the long the longer we live that there's always that one person mm-hmm. there's always that one person ate the tie pod <laughs> There's always that one person that did the cinnamon challenge to being dumb. Tried to catch the lawn darts. Yeah, try to catch the, the original lawn the darts. Original lawn darts. <laughs> right. Hey, look up in the sky. Here it comes. That looks like a ten metal dart. Had to it. <laughs> so this is one of those things where I think God's like, you know what? We I know there's going to be some of the new group go. Well, I didn't know. Mm-hmm. So it's almost what we used to call when I worked at one of my one of my former companies. I worked at. We call it the shotgun mm-hmm. effect. You know, 90% of us or 99% of us knew, hey, don't do that. There was always that one person who said, I didn't know. So then we all had to get the shotgun treatment when they messed up. We all had to, had to get punished for it. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of see this where the father, again, he's being very specific. He's saying, hey, by the way, some of this you should know. But for any of you who say, I don't know, I'm just going to be across the board. Everybody's going to get all the instructions at the same time. Mm-hmm. Well, and and it, it's, a, it's a fail safe, too, because we know. Throughout scripture, there's times where they have the scripture, and there's times when they don't. There's times when they're in captivity, and times when they get out. So it's, hey, you know, like when we talk about it often, but Ezra and Nehemiah, hey, we, we we don't have any of this. So let's go back and reread it, and everybody's like, oh, so you're so we weren't doing that. I thank you, God, for letting us know. Let's let's set that back up. It will pass over. Oh, we missed the first one. Thank you for the second one. We'll make we won't mess it up. So you know that's the other reason for it being there. Even though it's kind of like it should be kind of dumb moments, it's very much so. If you lose it and you get it back. We need to go back to square one. Mm-hmm. 
if you know we need to get back to the basics and um i think you know normally when we read this you know there's the uh marital relation stuff but in uh 24 it talks about if a man lies with her during her time of the month then he is unclean for seven days mm -hmm. i thought that was interesting because it's like you know it's almost like oh the woman is yucky and she's got to take care of it and she can't go anywhere and it's like no no, no dude like hey you got your responsibility too and, and it's it's not just a something wrong with women it's that's how god designed all ladies and it's it's a responsibility on both parties it's not some kind of weird male driven society it's like no everybody who messes up is unclean and then you just get yourself taken care of whenever your time's up you know when you're out of time out if you want to call it that then you go back and get back in the right order mm -hmm. so these things that make us unclean that stuff still applies like we do we do something and we are technically unclean but we don't have to then go, you know, shower and then be clean until evening because that was based off of like simple practices. Because I'm just, again, I'm assuming we're still made unclean by doing things that are outlined in the book, but we don't right. have any reason to then make ourselves clean other than just for hygiene. Sake. You know, in those situations, like I don't, I don't see the. So here is the rub. I don't see the application to today to, oh, I need to make sure I'm clean. So what's before, interesting is I actually, before I break it, right? yeah, I watched an entire video on how the Ashkenazi Jewish people, and they still take this very serious. Mm -hmm. Like for for two, two weeks out of the, the month or whenever the woman is on her period, they actually separate. Like she goes to a special place for this. And then before she and her husband can see each other again, uh, she has to do a mikvah, and then mm -hmm. they can because this is still taken very serious. We as Christians have just decided that oh, this is inconvenient, so but, <laughs> uh, so we're just not going to participate in this. But anything that so I don't know if this is one of those things that thus says y'all forever. This is one of his tenements forever, but it is a it is a practice that we should keep up because I mean you no. Know, I don't want to be vulgar about this, but mm -hmm. what what is the issue with with sticking with this? Like, oh, my wife is on her period. We should, you know, do accordingly to this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know. That's just thus says Nick. <laughs> so it's in here for a reason. And I know that you can get the arguments that Yah did or Yeshua and the whole nine yards, and we don't have to follow some of this stuff. But for the marital type of stuff, what what is the issue with with keeping this up? Mm -hmm. like I think a, I think there's there's so. some conventional wisdom there, like you're kind of to your point of, and I think some of it we kind of just naturally do, like, hey, today's a no day, you know, right. everybody just goes, oh, gotcha, thumbs up, move on, right? You look at her, she looks at you, she says, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're all just good, and then you just move on. So I think to your point, there is some like just practicality, right? Like, hey, it's just not gonna happen. But then, the, the Ryan, to your point, I do think this is specifically for going to Tabernacle or Temple because it mentions evening. We know that they would close the doors for the public at, at evening. It's not when the day started. That's whenever they were done working. So they were like, you're unclean during business hours. So don't come here today. Tomorrow in the morning, we open back up. Thumbs up. But yep. until evening, whenever we close, all this time, the whole open period, don't come in here today. Whole open time. Let's not use a better word here. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, don't I'm come in. Do some free workout, man. <laughs> <laughs> don't come in today because it's evening. But then tomorrow, hey, you're all good. You didn't do right, anything right, wrong. You just right. don't need to come here today, and that, and then, and that's fine. And it doesn't say like this. Get these guys or girls are bad sinners, no. ugly that they need to go live in another house. It's just you know, just don't come to the temple right now. That's it. We're we're all good. Same thing after you had your baby. Well, you know, yeah, you stay out for a little bit, bond with mm -hmm. your baby, get yourself all back. You know, in order because the woman's body does some stuff and it needs to heal up. Mm -hmm. Once you're good, hey, come on back, high five, we're good to go. So I don't see any of it as a negative. Like to Nick's point, it's practical, but I do yep. see it as it's just setting up temple rules. Let's just make sure we're keeping our temple clean, make making sure yep. you don't go and enjoy the fruits of life, and then ten minutes later you show up, you're like, hey, you know, go clean up. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> um, hey, uh, Robert, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, a different um, uh, Sabbath study that I joined a couple of hours ago. They were bringing this up. It's it's that uh, anything that we practice cleanliness uh, that is separating us from tabernacle is a 
picture or my birth cause of the picture that as mortals we are separate from anything in the heavenly so although we or many of us at this table and, and Catherine believe of the descending um kingdom uh that's prevented from us because of all mortality well the cleansing um is is exactly how Jonathan pointed out is that there's 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 practicalities and there's metaphorical sides to this. Uh, my my earlier moment there to say about Noah's flood or uh, the accepting of Yeshua as our, our master, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. These are these are current cleansings on a deep level which bring us into closer relationship with with our most high and in and with the practicality of our mortal bodies we can at least approach uh, the israelites could approach the mishkan that holy place no they were not you know dwelling in new jerusalem new zion but that was the closest comparison microcosm comparison that they could have and it's like you're practicing this here on earth you are mortal but I still have my rules for how you would come to me into New Jerusalem in the future. So thank you for listening. Love y'all. Absolutely, brother. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. And to kind of back this up some more too in here, <clears throat> as we finish out 15, it says, um, if verse 31 says, thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanliness, lest they die in their uncleanliness, when they defile my dwelling place in which there is in their midst. This is a Torah for the one who has discharge for him who emits semen and is unclean thereby. And for her who is sick in her monthly separation and for the one who has a discharge, either man or woman, and for him who lies with an unclean woman. So in all this is saying, Hey, this is actually to protect you because if you come to my, if you come to my tabernacle, you're going to die. I can't allow this uncleanliness to come into this place. So that, again, I'm going to read again. It says, Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanliness, lest they die in their uncleanliness when they defile my dwelling place. So this not only is there practicality in this, but it's also God saying, Don't don't bring that in here. This is a holy place. And the, the thought is that when New Jerusalem comes down, this will be an active requirement again. Um well, I guess for maybe the people outside the camp. I mean, inside the camp, these these aren't issues that you know, they're, they are gone. So, yeah, another thousand year reign would be different than the actual eternity. Mm. But, all right, well, <laughs> we'll get there when we get there. Yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> um, I just want to say in my note, it says all these cases involve the loss, you know, what we've been talking about, of bodily fluids and any loss of a life fluid, which is blood or semen. Su suggested death and was incompatible with the presence of God, who is perfect life. Mm. Incompatible. Don't be a square peg in a round hole. There you go. Right. All right. Anything else on 15? We'll move over to uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, yeah, one more thing. Uh, and I only just want to bring it up because we kind of get, I think these two get intermingled and confused and all wrapped up. Verse 30, and the priest shall use one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And we're like, oh, so they sin because they're using a sin offering. I think our understanding of what these offerings and sacrifices are um, needs some fine tuning for sure. And maybe some overhauling in some cases um, because it never said what their actions were sin. Right, but yet the offering is in the same category as what sin offering is. So we've always just assumed, oh, if there's a sin offering, then the automatically that equals they've sinned. But the same thing with the woman in her um, when they were having the the baby. Right, you had the sin offering and then the burnt offering. You're like, what, what sin did you, the baby didn't commit any sin? The the mom didn't commit any sin. They just had a baby. They they actually did. They actually followed the command of be fruitful and multiply. So original what, sin of Adam and Eve. <laughs> so what sin is being, you know, remitted or what sin is being accomplished here? And I think it's more of a categorical 
offering versus a actual sin has been committed. But I want to see if anybody had any thoughts or opinions on that so we can slightly st start to dig into this and put this issue to rest. I think it goes along the lines with purification and um, because some of the sin offerings, if you look back, are for sins both recognized and unknown. So I think that some of the sin offerings are for sins that you've committed that are transgressions that you may not even be aware of. So whenever whenever uh, you do the sin offering before any major event, it's to clear the, the air, so to speak, okay. or to clear anything out, any leaven. We're going to use leaven. Uh, clear that out as to so whatever this blessed event starts off might be will be started off with in covenant with Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So, so no, go ahead. I am. Um, this reminds me, and it kind of ties in with the uh, mikvah, right? Getting in the water and getting cleansed, where they would do that um, to cleanse themselves uh, mm -hmm. from being unclean. Yeah. But at least in like a modern practice. Uh, Jewish people will still do the mikvah for like big life changes. Yeah. When they're about to get into something. Yep. Sort of yeah. Wash away the old, get into something new. This is ceremonial so, washing, yeah. Yeah. And just at least it reminds me of that. I don't know if it's actually like connected. Well, I think Yeshua, when he got baptized by John, was the beginning of his ministry. Mm -hmm. And so therefore he was setting the example when he when he comes out of the water. He's like he's going from whatever his journey was up to that point. He says now everything's getting ready to change because immediately when he comes out of water, we see that the Holy Spirit settles settles on him. I, I believe that's the mantle the Father give him, and then we see immediately after that it says, "In the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted." So literally, it's like your your first day on the job. Here we go. <laughs> Hold on tight, boys. So, you know, it's like hey, there's no easing into this thing. Oh, I'm gonna be tempted by Satan for the next forty days, and I'm not gonna eat. All right, cool. That's that's yeah. that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's called a pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can go do mikvahs up at our house. Or at my house. Yeah, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I see you on there, Beetlejuice, Eternal Light. Um. If somebody is the, yeah, I mean, if I miss anybody else, I apologize. Sh shalom to you. Whose accent was that, Bill? Juice mine or Nick's? <laughs> Water. Bill <Her> Wooter. <laughs> So anyway. Oh, race. mine. <laughs> yeah, a little southern draw there. Nick, where are you from? All over. <laughs> I've been in Nick's, Nick's Nick Nick Nine Fifty Seven. Yeah. But I grew up as a military brat. So. All right, guys. So we have. If we don't have anything else, I grew up here all my life. So. Me too. I'm a sand lapper, but uh. Anyway, that, uh, that's it for me on 15. Unless anybody else has anything else to add to that, we can head over to uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, I believe it's chapter 4, right? I think so, yeah. Yep. I don't remember reading about Ichabod. Ichabod Crane. <laughs> Ichabod or Ebenezer. Ebenezer. All right, so like Joe said, 1 Samuel chapter 4 is where we're going to be reading. Yep. Did I page you saying? You did. You did. All right. Chapter four. And the word and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to the battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about four thousand men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. 
And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. And they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men of old Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they had been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and they fled every man to his home. And there was a great slaughter for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell and the Ark of the Covenant was captured and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas died. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with the and Moss says dirt on his head. Yeah, Moss says earth upon his head. Yeah, okay. He had clothes torn and with dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road, watching for a for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, what is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did you, <clears throat> how did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. And there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backwards from his seat by the side of the gate. And his neck was broken, and he died. And the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured... And that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth, and her pains came upon her. And about that, about the time of her death, <clears throat> and about the time of her death, the woman attending her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have born a son. But she did not answer or pay attention, and she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Mm. Okay. First thing I want to get into reading this is why on earth does that song say, this is where I find my Ebenezer because it doesn't sound like that's a good thing from this scripture. <laughs> I digress. Good question. Thank you. <laughs> You saw the message? Yeah. The, okay. I had, to, I had to jump back in. That's why I stopped reading halfway through. I was like, oh, it's going blank, but I got to finish. <laughs> we good? Yeah. All right. So what we got here, guys? Um, is there anything specific that ties the reason that God let them Israel lose in this instance? Can't think of one right now. Because I don't uh, think he's letting them lose just because of the sons of Eli. Well, I think it's the, the, the entire people. I think because right. when we go back to three, it says, And the young Samuel was serving Jehovah before Eli, and the word of Jehovah was rare in those days, no vision breaking forth. Mm -hmm. So the to me, it's like it's almost like God had truly almost completely left the camp. Mm -hmm. Other than in, in, in chapter three, we have him calling <clears throat> Samuel. You know, three times the Samuel thing is Eli. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the father's preparing someone. He's preparing this young man to be the next in line, and he's already because. Of, and later in three is um, Samuel. Or I'm sorry, not Samuel. But Eli's like, hey, don't whatever the Lord spoke to you, don't hold it back. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay, here it goes. Mm -hmm. By the way, you're gonna die. Your son's gonna die. Mm -hmm. You know, things are gonna happen. And I think there was such a lack of leadership. There was such a lack of people doing what was right. But the father's like, well, I'm going to have to show you something. Because when we go to, 
uh, verse 5 on, on 4 says, And when the Ark of the Covenant of, of Jehovah came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. They were excited. You know, but it's but what was funny is they were they were excited to see the ark, but I don't think they actually realized the presence of God wasn't there with them in this right. battle. They were thinking they were still doing right. It's, they even right. went into battle. If right. They, if the sons of Eli and the people actually thought that they were doing wrong and God wasn't with them, then they probably wouldn't have maybe gone out there. Like the sons of Eli would have hid back. They would have tried to stay protected. Was like God's not with us. Right. They go out and fight. They're all excited because they actually think that they're doing right in their in their own eyes. They're doing yes. right, and they just don't, well, they they, don't even get it. Right. God's not with them. It's almost as if uh, maybe I'm just speculating here. It's almost as if the the Ark of the Covenant has become their talisman. It's almost right. like this is our magic box that gets us out of trouble. This is when it shows up in the camp. I got you, Vicky. One second. This is our magic box that when it shows up, everything is good. Mm -hmm. So when we go back to the story of Samson. You know, Delilah's like, hey, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But she already cut all his hair off. And he it says he didn't even realize that the Spirit of God wasn't with him. Right. It said he ran out like he always did in the battle. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got these guys. Don't worry about it. And then he realized that they just bound him. They, put, they plucked his eyeballs out. His hair's cut. Mm -hmm. But he didn't realize that the Spirit of God had left. And I think this is the same scenario when the box shows up, the ark shows up. They're like, yeah. And the Philistines are like, the Philistines, and even the Philistines are like, we know when that box shows up, it's not good news for anybody. And we've never seen anything like this before or experienced anything like this before. Then God's like, yeah, but I'm not in the box. I'm not with the box. You're celebrating something, but you're about to be defeated mm -hmm. and, and not in a, in a really bad way. Mm -hmm. Vicki? Yeah, in my notes, talking about um, in three, why has the Lord defeated us? The elders' question uh, is appropriate insofar as it reflects the belief that the battle is the Lord's. They do not wait for an answer, however, but immediately take matters into their own hands, which was their bad. And then where it says, let us bring the ark, the elders apparent conviction that the ark was a magical guarantee of the Lord's presence is similar to that of the Philistine, Philistines um, salvation depends on God's free initiative and sovereign grace, not on human techniques or schemes. And then about, um, the, was it the two guys, Paulkney and Phineas, or Phineas, whatever, Phineas. Well, uh, with his two wicked sons in charge of the ark, it's not surprising that Eli's heart trembled for the ark of God. And, um, Jumping to 8, 10, 11, 13, and 18. Um, in 8, where it talks about mighty gods who struck the Egyptians, the Philistine, Philistines' cry of woe betrays their um, polytheistic mm -hmm. perspective, but nevertheless leaves little doubt of the impact that event had on surrounding nations. And then um, verse 10, where it talks about the 30,000, is far from bringing relief. Their Israelites attempt to manipulate, that's the key word, the Lord for their own ends resulted in even greater defeat. And then um, 11, where it talks about the Ark of God was captured, it was an event as astonishing as it was disastrous. The loss of the ark surely have um, have made two ears tingle. So I'm speaking in eleven, and then thirteen, his heart trembled for the ark of God. Early rebuke for honoring his sons more than the Lord. Eli now shows a concern for the ark of God that surpasses his concern for his own sons. And then the last thing on eighteen mentioned the ark. Not the news of heavy losses suffered by the Israelites, nor the news of the death of his own sons, but the announcement that the Ark of God has been captured prompted the reaction that resulted in Eli's own death. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I think one of the things, too, to go to go down that point is when we go back to chapter 3, it talks about where, where, where did Samuel go and lay down? He said he laid down in the temple 
next to the Ark of the Covenant. So it, he was, God was already putting him where he needed to be and was showing him what was supposed to be important and being held in certain reverence. So he, mm -hmm. when, when Samuel would have seen and heard of these things, he's like, oh, no, no, I definitely know better. What are we doing? You know what I mean? Like this, this um, is not what we should be doing. And the, I think the reason we get this chapter, like literally right afterwards, he said, I just gave this prophetic word. I gave this vision that God gave me. And I told Eli everything. Hey, you're going to die. Your kids are going to die. All this stuff's going to go back. Everything's going to go south for you. Next chapter, immediately everything goes south. So what, what it is is, one, it confirms with Eli and his kids. Samuel's not playing. But it also confirms with Samuel, when God talks to me, that's his, that's his goal. That's that's 100%. I'm not, I don't mm -hmm. have to question God ever again from this day forward. He told me this. Everything came to pass exactly how he said it. And I and he didn't have to – Samuel didn't lift a finger involving in any of this stuff. He said, but it was meant to happen that way. So we do see Eli dying. And, you know, the, the circumstances, I guess, are less important than the um, the actual event. So whether he fell out of a chair or fell out of the building or drowned or whatever, he said, you're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. your, your time is over. And then the priesthood, it seems as though, would have went to the sons. You know, it would have just followed the line of secession. God was like, nope, I'm killing them off too. There, there's, no, there's not going to be any forward momentum in history with this family. Mm -hmm. we're, we're done with this all the way. I'm bringing Samuel in. He's going to um, be the next. He's going this direction. It's going Samuel's direction. It's not going uh, Hophni or Phinehas. It's, it's not going that way. It's going to go this way. And so sometimes, it, it, you know, I think that's why they're like, well, God has defeated us because it's like, clearly this isn't our bar mm -hmm. doing. Like, we were just kind of going to regular battle. We should, we should be okay. Like, I don't know. This doesn't make any sense. And so I agree with when they bring the ark out, this was them like, oh, we don't know what else to do. We don't have any faith. We're not going to go trust God. We're not going to pray. We're just going to bring the ark and hope for the best. And God's like, I, I'm not a magical genie. I don't just show up because you want me to. I show up because I, whenever I say. It. And so did I tell you to go? Just like earlier when they, they would, the camp would move and the the spirit would move with the cloud or the fire. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, well, we're, we're just going to go off and take it ourselves. We're going to go down south. It's like, well, did the did the cloud take it go? No. It's okay. We got this. You know, God's with us. We've never lost. Why not? Uh, because God didn't go with you. Mm -hmm. so, and they, what are they all? They got utterly defeated, I think the word was. So it's very important to, if God says do it, then you do it. If God doesn't say do it, don't move. There's, right. there's no action to be taken. Not to mention, you don't take the whole, one of the holiest relics or holiest items of the temple at the time and bring that out. He says, this put this in this holy place. Keep it shrouded with gates and cloth and tabernacle walls. And uh, what's that thing called? The, uh, the big... Veil, the covered with the veil. This isn't sort of public consumption. This isn't an everyday event. And they're like, oh, just take it to the battlefield. It should be fine. I don't see what the problem is. We're, we're automatically going to get victory. And it's almost like God was like, well, I have to now make, I have to let this be a point now. I have to let you get destroyed because otherwise you're not going to understand this isn't how this works. And we're never, don't ever do this again. Now, for my own edification, Samuel was not here at this battle, correct? Probably. I mean, he was young. So, Maybe, but probably not. Probably not. Because it says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. And that's all. That's the last I see of him. And then it says, Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle, uh, and they pitched beside Ebenezer. So so real quick, I think when it says the word, I think that's going back to chapter 3. So everything he right. told to Eli, right. that word went to all of Israel. Everybody heard about the, the dream yeah. and the vision. Then Israel being Israel, it's like, you know what? Whatever yeah. he said, sure, let's go to battle with the guys that God said he's going to die. And once again... You know, you've got this witness in Samuel where the Lord was with him and they see all this stuff in chapter three. But then they decide they're going to go do all this other stuff with with uh, Phineas and his brother. Mm -hmm. And they still don't understand what's right. going on. And like, and like we've established, they believe that, you know, the Ark of the Covenant is some sort of talisman. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, want to back up just a tad in three at the end of three, it says. <clears throat> That Samuel grew up, and this is verse 19 of 3, it says, right. Samuel grew up, and Jehovah was with him and did not let any of his words fall to the ground. Right. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of Jehovah. And so I'm not sure how old he is at this point, but he's old enough that they're recognizing this. He's a young man. Yeah. That they're recognizing that, we're, you know, that Eli is no longer the prophet for Israel. Mm -hmm. And it says, and Jehovah continued to appear to uh, Shiloh because Jehovah revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh for the by the word of Jehovah. 
And so their forces, thus the word of the verse forces, thus the word of Samuel was in all Israel. It's because Israel already knew he's yeah. the guy. Right. So Israel already knows, hey, this ain't this, you know, this isn't good. And here's the other thing, too, that when, when you look at this, you look at we just finished talking about being clean and unclean. Yeah. Who is by the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> the two sons. And they're about as unclean as you're going to get. They're about as unmotivated to serve God as you're going to get. We're talking about they're, they're having relations with the temp, with the temple prostitutes. They're uh, they're 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 uh, profaning the, the the food as prepared for the priests. They're doing they're doing everything possible that is wrong. And they're the ones that are given like they're the ones where the ark is. Verse 4 says, and the people sent to Shiloh, and they brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah of Hosts, dwelling between the cherubim and the two sons of Eli, right. Hobni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark uh, of the Covenant of Elohim. No wonder the Spirit of God left the place. Like you take the, the two most unclean guys in the world, and you're going to put them here at my Ark? Mm -hmm. Do you think I'm going to show up with all this going on? And again, when they show up, the other people would have looked at him and went, oh, that's the art, man. We're in trouble. And then in the verse of 9, it says, be strong, uh, be strong and be men. You Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you, be men and fight. And so it was like, okay. And uh, so they went out there and they said, let's give it a shot. And then they did. Uh, can you imagine the surprise that they had or the wonderment they had? They're like, Wow, we just slew all of these thousands of guys with that Ark of the Covenant there. Something's up. Mm -hmm. So apparently we must have favor now because they leave with the Ark of the Covenant. With all they said about you know, the noise they heard and they shook the earth and they knew that the God brought them out of Egypt and all that their God did. I know it doesn't say it in there, but me personally, I interject because of Scripture gives other references where I believe God strengthened their heart. To go attack Israel, yeah. that they would not be afraid. Yeah, like, no, this is going to happen. Yeah, they, my children are getting fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think what we see is Israel, the 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 le whatever was left over, was living on their laurels. They were like, "Hey, we we were the guys who crossed over," and God's letting them know you didn't cross nothing. Right. You didn't have any faith. Right. You personally weren't involved mm -hmm. in that story. While this may be part of your lineage, just like the Jews in the New Testament. Oh, you may be sons of Abraham, but these rocks can be sons of Abraham. That that is, means nothing in the, in the right. grand scheme of things, um, and as, if you're sons at all. Uh, but you know, whenever it's going here, it's saying you don't get to just uh, live on live in the past and just take all that credit. You know, you got to walk this out too. Now, I think why this was a big issue is, and Vicky brought it up, that the Philistines were very polytheistic. They were like, yeah. "Oh, you bring the ark and your gods." God's so plural, who's right? if if they win, who's getting the glory there? Yeah. random gods right no no he says if you come and you bring my name and i show up i'm getting the glory and the yeah. people there were clearly not prepared to give god the glory they were prepared right. to give the ark the glory yep oh we brought our special items so our champion beats your champion he's like yep. god's like no, no no i see this there's there's a way that this works and it's i'm gonna get all the glory my name's gonna be magnified if i'm gonna go to battle and they're gonna assume some random god showed up the alligator defeating god and the locust defeating god do you think that's who i am I'm not, I don't. I don't have any part in that. This isn't a battle where God's name's involved. This is a battle between sinful people and other sinful people that are right. trying to pretend, to some extent, that they are the same guys that came out of Egypt, the same guys that walked across the water, same guys that had faith to uh, paint the door. You know, with the, the Passover night. These guys here today, th these aren't those guys. These guys mm -hmm. are poking meat in the in the water pot. You know, this is this is off the rails. <laughs> They're not even cooking the meat the prescribed right. way. There, there's no part of this that makes any sense. And he's like, I'm gonna take little boy Samuel, and he's you know growing up now. This guy, he knows where his where where he's supposed to be. He's in the temple. He's there ministering to Eli. He's like, this is the leader in charge. Unfortunately, Eli can never Eli Samuel can never step into his full role until these three guys are out of the picture. And God's like, not only am I going to make it. Apparently obvious that it's Samuel, but I'm also going to remove any obstacles. So it has to be Samuel. You don't even have a choice now. But also, who got who got the glory? Because right at the beginning, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel. And right before that, it said that clearly he's a prophet. Yeah. So now with Samuel saying these guys are going to die, you're going to lose everything's going to be bad. Samuel gets the all the attention, 
And then Samuel says, not me, God. So yeah. then through Samuel, God got the glory. Right. Through Eli and the sons, God got none glory. It was just the Philistines thinking of some random gods in a shiny box. Yeah. So I think there's a really specific reason that it went down that way. And it was mostly because the Philistines were like, yeah, we don't know you. All we know is you guys have some cool powers and you brought the box with the cool mm -hmm. powers. And you're like, God's like, I'm not a, I'm not a genie. I don't, I don't just walk right. around with the magic wand. There was a reason that I thought of the powers is because I was protecting my people because they were following me and in covenant with me. Yeah. These guys aren't following my ways no. and my covenant. So I don't show up in the same way. I'm still right. their God. I'm still, I'm still sovereign. Right. But I don't show up to these guys like that. You know, like we even hear about the, the prayer of the righteous availeth much. He's like, it's not that the prayers of everybody else doesn't get listened to, but hey, you're one of mine and you're uh, all fully, completely sold out. Oh, yeah, you definitely got my ear because I'm using you and we're working together on this. So I wanted to bring something up that you sparked back in my brain. I was thinking earlier. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah there we go. Yeah. <laughs> smoke coming out. Yeah. yeah. I need to put some oil in there. <laughs> no, we were talking about the, um, we were having a conversation earlier about how it felt like they were using as, the Ark of the Covenant as a good luck charm. Yeah. Not really knowing because, again, you didn't realize God wasn't even with you. And you're sending the two most unclean guys. I'm sure everybody's unclean, but these are two of the most, you know, not doing the right thing, guys. Um, But let's see. I think it was Beetlejuice that said something that sparked my brain a little bit, too, and that if I could find it. Uh, let's see, let me go back through these real quick. Anyway, one of the things was with that was how we use the Holy Spirit today. Mm. Oh, yeah. Because we think that like then it's almost like they felt like, well, this is power on tap. Mm. We can use it anytime. Oh, we're going out to battle? No problem. Make sure you got it hooked to the wagon. We're going out there with the, with the you know what I mean? Yeah. No big deal. We're going to win this one hands down, right? It's like, and sometimes I feel like we think that we can just do, say or do whatever we want to in the name of God. And all of a sudden throw some Holy Spirit in there and think that we're going to command the Holy Spirit to do whatever our will is. And I think that there needs to be, we need to kind of need to step back a little bit and think about that a little bit more. Because just as the Ark of the Covenant, that the Spirit of God in the past would be with them, that when that Ark showed up. Boom, it was it was a guaranteed win. Mm -hmm. God leaves when God leaves, that's the actual power. It isn't the ark itself, it's the father who is the power. Right. And so I think we need to do sometimes when we're dealing with and we're doing different ministries and we're and we're saying things and we're trying to command the Holy Spirit to do this and the Holy Spirit to do that, that we need to be very careful because what I think we see a lot of times in the Bible isn't people commanding the Holy Spirit to do anything, it says the Holy Spirit showed up. And when the Holy Spirit showed up, then things happened. Paul didn't command the Holy Spirit to show up. Peter, whenever the day of Pentecost, didn't command the Holy Spirit to show up. And they start speaking in different languages. The Holy Spirit itself showed up, and then things happened by those who were obedient. So I think we, we've kind of come down this road 2,000 years later where we think we have all this authority to command the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit, the word in it, is holy. Mm -hmm. And we need to be very careful because that's all I'm gonna say with us. We just need to be very careful about how we want to command the Holy Spirit to do things, or we want to we want to throw out their Holy Spirit fire, or we want to do all these different stuff. I don't think God's on tap like that. God's like, when I want my spirit to move and I'm commanding you to do something in the spirit, that's different than you wanted to take control of a situation and all of a sudden and you want to act like you have control of the Holy Spirit yourself. Just my just my two shekels on no, that. No, I 100 percent agree with you, and I'm gonna I'm gonna camel twist off of that. So <laughs> I, I completely agree with what you said, and a lot of times it's exactly like what happened here, where we put the cart before the horse, where we think that we're in control of the situation, and we do the steps exactly backwards. We go get ourselves into a situation, then pray to God, and then uh, it works out. So we think that we're in His favor, as mm -hmm. opposed to praying to God listening for his response and then do it being obedient to what he tells us to do. So it's exactly like them going and grabbing the, because how many times have we done things that are really technically our desire? It, it quasi works out. <laughs> and then we immediately think that we're in God's graces because oh, all this right. is obviously the will of God because it's what I wanted and it worked out. So mm -hmm. he's answering my prayers. 
later on down that exact same path, you find out that, oh, no, there's there you are going to walk out the consequences of what you asked because for what you asked for, it wasn't of the will of God. He's letting you walk out the consequences of your actions from not going to him first. Mm -hmm. So it's the exact same thing with them in the ark where they're like, oh, let's go make war with the Philistines. They go make war with the Philistines. Oh, we're getting our behinds handed to us. Let's go get the Ark of the Covenant. That'll fix everything. And they go and get the Ark of the Covenant, and they have this giant rally, and they have this, you know, uh, earth-shattering roar, and then they get the behind spanked, and everybody dies. Because once again, they've taken God out of the equation of actually going to him first, mm -hmm. and then going and proceeding in his will. Yeah. Yep. And we do it. So do it. To agree with y'all, I guess to add a little bit more to it, maybe you ought to have some sort of animal and then some sort of action. <laughs> uh, and the saying, like, a, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing according to the word of God, mm -hmm. um, then you'll be where you're supposed to be. And so, if you have those two things, you're doing what you're supposed to do, you are where you're supposed to be, the Holy Spirit will show up. Mm -hmm. Not like it's a guarantee necessarily, God has his own will and you know, right. desires for certain mm -hmm. things. But uh, yeah, you don't just we don't just get to command it and you know, create scenarios right. where we're we're expecting it to show up. Right. Well, I think that's where again we have to be careful because that, that goes into witchcraft mm -hmm. with the whole name it, claim right. it, blab it and grab it, the whole whatever that is. Right. It's because you are trying Slide to manifest down. something in and using God to do it. Yep. And and it's like and God I me mean, like nah, maybe I don't want that for you. Maybe I don't want the situation to happen the way you're trying to make it happen. And you're trying to speak it into existence. Yep. Mm -hmm. We have to be very careful because there's enough witchcraft in the church right now as, in a, as a whole, way more than needs to be there. And people aren't understanding that you're not walking in the ways of Jehovah, you're walking in the ways of, of Hasatan. And, and the, your father. the saying yeah. that I brought up, do what you're supposed to do, you'll be where you're supposed to be. To me, that's just a great, simple way of like, like defining like what the kingdom is like, working for the kingdom is like. Yeah. You know, reading the word, doing what you're supposed to do. Having God to lead you, you'll be where you're supposed to be, and in those moments, the Holy Spirit will show up, you know, to um, get certain things done that you by yourself cannot. Yeah. Yes. But I think I think a really good example of that is Jacob. You know, whenever he's hearing all this information about Joseph being in, in Egypt, and they're, they're asking for the youngest brother and all this stuff, and he's like, "I'll go to Egypt when God tells me to go. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna sit right here and I'm gonna pray about it, and I'm gonna wait to be led by the Spirit." And you know, like, obviously, I don't think he probably would have done anything wrong. He, he was already, he was supposed to go. Like, right. he already knew I'm going to be going. And I, he, in his mind, he says, I he already planned. Th this is this is an event that's going to happen. But it's not going to happen on my time. It's going to happen on his time. And, you know, maybe if he leaves a week earlier, he gets robbed and mugged and he gets sold into slavery or whatever. But he's like, I, I believe in God so much that I'm not going to literally move until he tells me to move. Or right. Abraham, out of the blue, hey, I'm from a country over there. Yeah. God shows up. You need to go over there. Okay. Leave everything. All your people, all your family, all their stuff. Just go over to this new land and walk around and you own all of it now. He's like, this is different. But you I mean when you're being led by the spirit, you get to make the Bible story. When you're being led by yourself, you get to just throw oil against the wall and look stupid. You know what I mean? And you walk, and then God's letting you walk that failure out of I thought uh whenever I commanded the spirit, I thought whenever I said in the name of Jesus, I thought when I pleaded the blood, I thought when I said get out, everything just worked. Right. But it's clearly not true and it's not happening. And so then you have to mm -hmm. go and deal with like these guys. You're dealing with the defeat of my ways aren't his ways it is making it abundantly clear. And so I think we do have to be super careful to say, I, I think Ryan's point is spot on. If we were if we're doing what we're supposed to do, we're where we're supposed to be. When God wants to show up and, and when he wants to send his spirit, we should be there willing and able to say yes. Hey, Ryan, I want to use you to go heal this guy. But well, why are you with this guy? Because you've been helping him every week. You've been ministering to his life. And you, he knows that you're not going to take any of the glory. You're going to give all the glory to God because you're following his ways. You know what? I'm going to use you. And I'm going to send my spirit. And you're going to do something supernatural. You yourself, the human, the DNA man standing in front of me, has no power. Right? You're just a flesh suit. You're going to die and go back to the dirt. Mm -hmm. But the spirit in you has the power. And the spirit in you is what's going to move. And I think we lose sight of that so often of I, I healed somebody. So now I'm going to go around and lay hands on everybody. Well, since when? Since where? Right. And, and unless it happens with 100% accuracy, mm -hmm. then that's not the Holy Spirit. Because when the Spirit moves, like Joe says, you mm -hmm. get a Pentecost moment. You get a prayer that mm -hmm. everybody gets to hear the message and get saved. You're like, oh, that's success. Me just going up and standing on the soapbox on the corner, 
unless everybody gets saved, you know, that's not that same spirit moving behind right. it. And unless that's what God told you to do, of course. So I think that's a huge point that we should yeah. be more thoughtful of when we just go and pick up our anointing oil and we just go pick up our holy water and we go pick up right. our whatever. And we're like, this is the answer. I can, yeah. I can fix it. And you're like, cause I can tell you right now what our strong suits are. Thus say it's Nick, say it's Nick. And what's happened in my life is, what I'm strong at is never what I'm called to do. <laughs> it's normally the stuff that I am horrible at. And I'm just saying this is in my life. <laughs> it's normally the stuff that I'm horrible at. And it requires me to lean on him yep. for for it to happen because right. I don't know what I'm doing from step one. Mm. So I have to pray about it and, and re-pray about it because I'm, I'm self-conscious. And then that's when the blessings happen. And that's when, because it's walking in truth, true faith because whenever all this stuff you know I, I i'm a i'm a blood instrument so when stuff happens i immediately want to go the blood instrument route so and that's that yeah i was like no my way is love mm -hmm. so right we're gonna do this the loving way any of you ladies on the we need to remain open to again what god's will is because Pretty positive. Paul was doing what he was supposed to do. <laughs> he was where he was supposed to be. Yeah, he still ended up having a lot of bad stuff happen. Yeah. Oh yeah. But the Holy Spirit showed up when he needed to. Got him out of prison. Got him out of jail. Saved mm -hmm. his life from a snake bite. Yada yada yada. Get break, beat yeah. Him, yeah. yeah. Now, well, that's the one thing that again, when when you get saved, everyone thinks, "Oh, you get saved, no, nothing bad's ever going to happen." Man, we live in a fallen world. Things are going to happen. Yeah, cars are gonna break. We're gonna lose jobs. We're gonna the washing machines are not gonna be working. Whatever it is, <laughs> right? I mean, things are gonna happen. But in the midst of that, I thank God that through all the trials and tribulations, that His Spirit's been with me the whole time. Because without it, man, it'd been rough. I'm, I'm like, I honestly look at people who aren't religious or anything at all and go, man, it, it must to me it must be a little bit tougher for you to go through certain situations. Yep. I was that person, and it was horrible. Yeah. Been gone through tough times since you know accepting God and walking it out and everything, but it's so much better, right? I have like the passing of my mom, and that happened 10 years ago, could have been way worse of a scenario for me, right? Something like that peace that passes. Was well, that's how you finish that all understanding or something? I'm just kidding, <laughs> you know. Um, Miss Cleveland said that, uh I can find real quick, but she basically said that not only, yeah, she said here, not only have witches infiltrated churches, but also into the tour community as well. And I would agree with you 100% because I've already dealt, I've already dealt with them. So, witches are not shy. Well, they try to come in in a covert way, but the father has a way of weeding that stuff out. So, hallelujah to that. Kind of like the tears. Yeah. But that weed's got to get out, or that uh, that weed's got to get out of here. <laughs> All right, it's terrible, it's terrible. <laughs> All right, guys, we got uh, we got time to jump over to Hebrews chapter ten. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of cool. That, again, we get to see as we're reading through these passages how the uncleanliness of that camp at that time of Israel. God's like, hey, I'm out. I'm out of 500, right? So 5,000, out of 5,000. See, this is my blunt <laughs> instrument over here. It's not, it's not it's, no, the Audi 5,000 is a car. No. <laughs> we won't, we won't ask anybody online to look that up. <laughs> my brother had the Volkswagen Quantum, which was the same car, only Volkswagen. Oh, okay. All right, cool. That uh, gets us through the tour study right there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Hebrews chapter 10. And, Are we on uh, 10 or 11? Because I already have 10. Yeah, we're on 11. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm one behind it. I, have to, I need to go back and fix that I in my... notations from 10, which means that was last week. All right. So, All right, so we're, we're in 11. Am I bad? I'm still one behind for some reason. <laughs> but you just wanted to go back and restudy. That's right. It was that good. It was that good. Do it one more time. All right, so Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> you get to read by Enoch. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by the people of old received their com commendation, the faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain 
through which he was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever draws near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah was being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. In reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that was <clears throat> that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that had foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive. Even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and that they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were in who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of a fire escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They were about to... They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the word of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains, and in dens and in caves of the earth. All <clears throat> and all these, though commended through 
Their faith did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. That was cool, cool, cool little history lesson. Yeah. Yep. The, uh, the writer of Hebrews clearly knew his scripture, because he just broke down the majority of the Old Testament in the chapter. Yeah. Joe, in your version, every time it said faith, is you have belief, right? Yeah, belief. Sean the non-believer. Sean. So, to me, the very end there, showing that they have not received the promise and um, all waiting for we all receive it. Mm -hmm. um, are there other, to me, clear, it was clear. Are there other clear examples like that one that show that, you know, all the previous people, my mom hasn't received her, you know, resurrected body. She's not like looking down on me. She's not active and, you know, heavenly duties and stuff like that. You know, other examples that are sort of clear like this one. I would say the verse, um, and I, I, don't, I don't have the reference off the top of my head, but um, it talks about the coming of Messiah. And it says, at the coming of Messiah, the dead in Christ will arise first. So that means the dead are still dead and they have not arisen. So they they were going to happen first, but not infinitely in the past or, you know, in sporadically throughout um, human history. It's at the time of the coming, first the dead, then the rest will be caught up. So um, to me, that's kind of saying there's there's an order of operations, but it's not a every person that dies according to, you know, if you have to be dead for a certain amount of years or your purgatory period or anything weird like that. It's everybody's dead I and mean, everybody has passed. You know? We don't all raise after three days, like right, exactly. Body. So I would say to me, that's the strongest evidence of we're all dead. And he's saying even the sea will give up their dead. You know, it doesn't matter who you were, where, when you lived, how you died. If you were burnt, drowned, somehow if you went up to outer space or something, wherever you're at, God's like on that day I got I'm going to get everybody. And then the people who are alive, then he'll um, will be caught up as well. So yeah. to me, at least that's that's more of a clear definition of. All these guys haven't received even well. I mean, when Yeshua died, he went down and they were still down there. So, yeah. you know, he's like, I, I'm looking at you guys in Sheol. You're not in heaven, you're not glorified, you're not angel wings. You know, you're people down here. I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're from a different doctrinal stance. They say that, well, they were dead down there. Yeah, but once Yeshua raised up, that he like resurrected all of them after. So, what about the people between right. that moment and today? You know, that we have to. I guess they would say that they just they get resurrected as soon as they die. I don't really know what what they would say. I just know that I, I was I wanted to find more than just this one instance from Hebrews eleven to you know speak to my friends and family where they have that misunderstanding of mm -hmm. like what's going on after uh, a believer dies. But it's a hard conversation anyway. It's something that's been debated <laughs> in theological circles forever. What yeah. happens when you die? Here's here's the thing though, whether we fully see it or understand it or not, but those those that are called by him, that those who served him, who die in the Father, they're they're in a good place regardless. Whether it's in a place, whether it's in a place of consciousness or not, or if we're going back to the garden, whatever that looks like. I personally believe we go to the garden. I believe it's the garden is the holding place uh, for the time of when um, Yeshua calls everyone, gives them their new resurrected bodies and all that stuff. I believe that there is a holding place for those who are found righteous in the Father, mm -hmm. and still those who who died, not in a good place, that they're held in a place of judgment until that time. Yeah, I know the uh, the other reference that I would use under the Hebrews eleven, there would be like some of the references in Psalms, how they were resting, they rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but again, that's Old Testament thing, so they would, <laughs> they would come like, oh, I'm old and it's changed. And, um, but yeah, I don't think that they're resting in a negative sense, mm -hmm. right? The, right. The, the purgatory idea. Um, I just think it's it may somewhat be accurate, but I don't view it as a negative. We throw purgatory out like it's just a holding cell, but purgatory is actually in true Catholic, like how, how what what is believed purgatory is where your soul was like a gray area. Yeah. So purgatory isn't just some holding place. Purgatory is basically a level of hell that you go to yeah. where your living relatives can pray you or, well, not pray you out of, they can buy you out of this place. Right. So 
we throw the word purgatory around a lot, but there it's an actual specific place for people to be bought out of right. or prayed out of. I definitely made sure to quote it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I definitely when I use the word, I didn't fully understand. Right. So <laughs> I would say, I would say Sheol. So because Sheol is biblical, it's yeah. And hell, of course, comes from Hella, which is actually, you know, Germanic. Mm -hmm. So what we see through this chapter is a lot of faith. And then mm -hmm. we see faith of all the men of old, the women of old. Right. You know, like I said, that's I, I love reading through scriptures and not dealing with religion. Right. Because so much of religion, so much of history has said men are on one level, women are on another level. And you're like, hey, no, it clearly says. And then don't forget about Sarah. Don't forget about Rahab. Hey, yeah. It's going through. Hey. Without these people, this story is over. Right. This story is, or it's it's a completely different. Mm -hmm. And so there's no man-centered version of the Bible. It's the Bible is for all people. God created all humans in his image. He said, I love the women and the men just the same. And without the women doing their job, there is right. no more man anyway, because we all were born from a woman. So he's like, you guys, don't be dumb here. Right. And I love that that little bit of aspect of Hebrews kind of comes out and it's not something you're probably ever going to hear preached. It's not something that anybody's ever going to make a YouTube video on. Right. But it's something I think we should take into account sometimes is remember these stories all work together. Now, let's not take it down the Catholic road where it's now it's holy, super duper mother Mary. Right. You know, <laughs> uh, yes, everybody does come from a woman, but she was not immaculately conceived of her own doing or anything yeah. special like that. Other than she was, like Ryan said earlier, a willing vessel who was doing the right thing for the right, right. reasons at the right time. God said, I can use you. Right. It wasn't that she had any magic pills. She didn't drink the right, you know, soup or something. So, but what we see throughout this whole chapter is faith. And I think, you know, in a lot of the messianic walks, a lot of the Torah walks, you get, you can get real easily left and start getting dogmatic, start following Jewish tradition, start following Talmudic tradition, start yeah. saying, well, we have to do this, and this, and this, and this, and this. I mean, look at Hanukkah, for example, a, 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 a holiday doesn't really show up in the scriptures yet. There's a thousand rules for it. A thousand ways to do it. You got to have this kind of brand and this kind of food and this kind of days and this many da da. Where did all these rules come from? He said, these these guys were saved by these guys were counted righteous by their faith. Right. So he said, I didn't ask you to go make a thousand rules. I didn't even ask you. I didn't, I didn't even mention that Abraham followed every commandment. Yeah. I showed you that Abraham was faithful. And whenever whenever I showed him a command, when I taught him Hebrew, whenever I got him in the place where I could use him, yeah, of course he followed the commands. He right. built the altar. He did the Sukkot. He, he picked the people over the money. He did the right thing, but it was his faith that got him to the position to be in tune with the Father. So now that I'm faithfully showing up, now that I'm faithfully available, teach me your ways and your words so then I can follow them because of my faith. He didn't say, oh, I'm just going to follow these bunch of rules and don't I'm, I don't care what the results are because I'm just going to do them and get my boxes checked. Mm -hmm. So definitely uh, a really, really cool chapter just from the aspect of faith. Oh, yeah. I want to see if I can find it real quick because it talks about Abraham and it's something that I've never, I've never fully thought of was that uh, you've got Abraham by faith. Abraham went uh, by faith. Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac and he that had, had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall this thy seed be called accounting that God was able to raise him even up from the dead. So I've never put that into perspective about how Abraham, he would have, he would have killed Isaac mm -hmm. because he fully had faith that God was going to be true to his word for him. And he, God had already told him, this is, this is the one that I'm going to have your covenant with. Right. This is, this is your, who your seed is going to be through. Right. So that's, so, ultimate faith. <laughs> yeah. So he never at once questioned it to the point where the angels having to stop him from, you know, cutting Isaac in half because he, he fully, he, that full faith, he fully mm -hmm. has faith. Oh, well, God's going to honor this commitment that he, or covenant that he's made with him. So even if I have to kill Isaac, he'll resurrect him if that's what's necessary to yep. fulfill that faith. Or fulfill that covenant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was reading this with my boys last night, I was thinking in my head, like, this one chapter answers some sort of gray area questions that people Amen. have had mm -hmm. you know, about what was Abraham thinking? What was he going right. to do? Did he have some sort of backup plan? <laughs> no, no. He was thinking that God yeah. was going to resurrect the child that he just killed. Yeah. If that's what he had to do. Yep. And that's full faith. Yeah. And then verse six. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. So he's like, 
you know, that whole conversation with James, James is so on it that he's like, faith without works is dead. Right. But the inverse is also true. You can't just go out here and do a bunch of works with no faith. It is, it is impossible to please the Heavenly Father unless you have faith. Yep. And it goes on the very beginning. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So without the thought process of, God, I know already that your, your promises are true. I have faith in them. I'm going to walk out in them. But we're still waiting for that evidence and all this other weird stuff. He's like, what? Well, without faith, it's impossible. And I, and I love that it uses that word because he could have used very difficult or, you know, it's like the eye of a needle with the camel conversation. It's real hard. No, no, impossible. Zero percent right. chance. No faith. You're out of here. Right. But then it, it then in, in James, it kind of makes sure, hey, don't don't get it to where you're starting to confuse the facts. Faith, it, it, it's impossible without faith. But if there's no works, it's dead. Yep. So then mm -hmm. what would be the point? And I think you know, on our on both sides of the conversation, we got side that's like, oh, it's all works. Faith is whatever. They got right. the other side, it's all faith, the works are whatever. And it's right. like, no, no, these are these are peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. And if, and if you don't have them both, that sandwich is weird, yeah. right? And it, it's not gonna work right. And I think that we we need to make sure that we keep that perspective of it's like a 50-50. Mm -hmm. As much faith as we have, we need right. that much obedience. With that much right. obedience, we need to turn around have that much exact faith. And I think our balance gets off sometimes. We are too much faith, not enough obedience, way right. too much obedience, and like almost none faith. Right. Uh, and it's just, it, it's very interesting to put into perspective because whenever you discount and disqualify all the works, no works is not our salvation. We right. all understand that. But at the, we're reading chapter after chapter after chapter in the midsection of our <laughs> Bible study of people doing things that is right in their own mind mm -hmm. because they don't understand what y'all is actually asking them. You got the guy showing up with the the uh, um, Ark of the Covenant today, thinking that it's a ma magic talisman because they don't understand the beginning of the book. They don't understand what's going. And and granted, they had lost that because they had not been keeping it up. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just we need to keep that into perspective in our walk nowadays. And I know this doesn't go for most of the people in this conversation because they they're in this walk with us. But it, that's it, it's just that. It, my words are escaping me now. <laughs> and, and that's, it, it's just, it just, it's hard for me whenever I'm talking to family members and they're all about, oh, the beginning of the book was, or the Old Testament was done away with when Yeshua nailed it to the cross. And it's like, you guys have absolutely no idea what y'all is asking me today. You're, you're walking as blind as you're you possibly can. You're walking as blind as you possibly can. Yeah. So, because yeah. okay. nothing else on this side of the book is going to make, truly make, make sense, true, right. sense to you. Because everything goes back. Right, because if you didn't need the bag of the book, this chapter would just rip this chapter out. Right. Like, yeah, who, who cares what Abraham did and right. Esau? You know, next. Yep. All right. So faith again. Cool. <laughs> but no. So what we see, and I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in real quick here. Uh, verse 10. For he, talking about Abraham, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations. Oh, cool. A city with foundations? That's normal. Whose designer and builder is God? Oh. All of a sudden, not normal anymore. Right. This guy is has this future super awesome vision of the heavenly realm. He's like, I know this God that I'm serving, the city that I'm looking for is not any of these ones. Right. God, I'm walking around and I's taking all this land because God said, wherever you go, that, that's now your possession. What I'm looking for, that city has a foundation. Yep, meets the criteria. That one, this one wasn't built by God. That one wasn't built by God. This temple wasn't built by God. Ah, I have something that faith. Of the assurance of things hoped for, he's like, I know that city's real. I know that city exists. I can't wait for that city. All this right. other stuff is just meantime stuff. We're all working toward that end goal of that heavenly city. It's going to come back in here in a, in a couple of verses, but I, we can't go throughout this chapter without talking about Abraham, knowing there's a new Jerusalem coming, knowing it's a city mm -hmm. that nobody has built but God. And the, I have a different point, but to your point, <laughs> um, that part you just brought up, how he knew about it. And there's other references that talk about the patriarchs. They knew about the city coming or, you know, the, uh, the promises. And in my first few years in this walk and learning and studying the first five books, I didn't understand where they got that information from because I don't really see it in the first five books. So it had to come from extra stuff, right? And so then going over Jubilees and uh, Enoch and then some of the other writings, but like, okay. They did have information mm -hmm. that would allow them to know about this coming promise. Yeah. Because I don't think it's actually in the first five books. Yeah. I don't. It's, I think it's sprinkled in there here and there. You got to kind of know that that's what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. But it's not clearly laid out like in the 12 Patriarchs where they're like, there's a coming Messiah and a super city and we're ready for it. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that, that part always confused me in the first few years. It's like, I don't understand how they know 
what they're looking for. They just didn't see it. But um, yeah, really just giving credence and credence to there were extra writings and stuff that they had uh, in their possession that they were learning from. Uh, so then my other point was 11, Hebrews 11, 13. These all died in faith. That's like specifically talking about Abraham, Sarah, Isaac. They all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them. They embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Mm -hmm. I just know for me, I really hope this settles in, you know, my spirit that, you know, I'm a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. I don't need to be looking at things like, like, that's my home. This is like all my stuff. And uh, just have that worldly mindset that we pretty much are all, maybe not you, mm -hmm. but <laughs> we were all sort of raised up in um, to go get as much as you can, you know, mm -hmm. make a nice life for yourself here. Um, but to have that, that mindset of Abraham, he was in the place that was promised to him, and yet he was still acting as a stranger you know, in the land because mm -hmm. he was looking past his earthly life. Mm -hmm. He was looking forward to the promises of the future. And so even, even whenever we go through, it uh, doesn't have to be about possessions. Even when we go through bad and negative times, to me, I've learned that that's how you can keep the faith, the, the joy, the hope, the love. Because even in the negative, bad, horrible, awful times that you might go through in life, you keep that focus on the promise, on what's coming to you, mm. right, as a good and faithful servant. Uh, yeah, you can maintain that joy and that peace. It can be a light. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Robert, go ahead real quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. Maybe all, the, all the brothers at the table have said as much as kind of mostly to what Nick said. Uh, it comes to the, the Brit how to shock the first maybe 90 years. Well, most of the epistles teach how to live in the same vein and in the same spirit of beliefs and faith and deeds as the previous 3,000 odd years, like the Brit Hadashah must line up with with the previous amount of years of faith and history. Mm -hmm. It's guiding us presently that, that with the Holy Spirit, with the uh, sacrifice of what our high priest has done, these 80, 90 years of the Brit Hadashah point to how to do it in in the spirit of our fathers of the of the faith before them. So thank you so much. Awesome. Amen. Thanks. Good stuff. Yeah. You have something? Mm -hmm. Verse 16. But as it is, they, all these people from before, these patriarchs, they uh I lost my face that fast. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. So again, the eyes are upward, not on the earth. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. This, this Ryan, goes to your point. I mean, almost like you talk about driving it home. This is driving it home back and driving it there again. You know, it, it's saying that these guys, because of their vision of the heavenly realm, because of their vision of the future that has nothing to do with what's happening here on the earth other than us being in the right place with the Father, us being in a relationship with him so we can go to this place. Um, other than that, all this stuff passes away. You know, in Lamentations, it says, you know, all is vanity. All this stuff is just to make me feel good, make my life look better, make my situation better. All, all this can go because at the end of the day, if it's not about me and the Father, that's all that's going to last. That's all that's going to carry forward. Mm -hmm. So it says because um, they desired the better country. So they knew this is good. Good is good. We, we should never discount good. God created the earth and said it is good. Every total, right? Isn't that word mean good? Everything he created was good. So he didn't say, I created you a bad place. I created you bad humans. I created bad houses. Everything on the earth is good. But there is better. And it was just like the just like the covenant with Yeshua and the high priest, there are good high priests, but he's going to give us a better one. He didn't say that all the Levites were doo-doo. He just said, no, there's a good, but there's a better one. This earth, this is awesome. I, this is the best of my creation, but I have something even better. I'm going to bring it to you. It's a surprise. You know what I mean? He's given us this the the surprise party in advance and be like, be looking forward to this. And then it says, therefore, so because of those facts, God is not ashamed to be called their God. So he's saying, when the writer of Hebrews is like, those guys got it. Those guys, God and them are like on the same wavelength. God says, 
I love these guys. I, I want to be your guy. Abraham? Oh, yeah, me and you. We're going to write this down in the story. I'm going to make sure Moses captures this mm -hmm. at least twice. We're going to write it in Genesis and we're going to write it in Jubilees. Oh, Abraham, you get in the book twice. Good job. <laughs> Enoch, Noah, right? That's why we're going through these lists. These guys, guys, like, I'm cool with them. You don't see Eli in here. You don't see that one Phineas or, you know, all the Hafti or whatever. Those guys didn't make the story because he, he's like, I'm, I don't want to be called their God. I, I, they're lucky I even showed up. Right. You know, so I think there's a there is this call to action here where he's like, here's your examples. Now, what are you going to do about it? God was their God. Is God your God? Are you the same people that they were? Are you living the same way they were living? Is your vision on the heavenlies or is your vision still here trying to make a dollar? Because he's like, if you want to if you want God to look at you that way, then you need to live that kind of life. And I think that's just a huge right in the middle of the chapter. He's like, bam, deal with that. And I'm going to tell you some more stories. <laughs> and through all that, it's not as if. Our lives during this time period on earth are pointless. No, not at all. No, as we go and do believe this, the expectation is that we are to sort of bring people along with us. Exactly. Um, again, We're his hands and feet. The light on the hill. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's not all toil, right? Yeah. We get the opportunity to show up at the temple and at the New Jerusalem. Absolutely. You know, for this, this this entire chapter, I think somebody alluded to it earlier in the chats about this, you know, they were excited for this. It's like the faith chapter. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, again, the, the writer, whether it's Paul or whoever it is, did a great job of basically summing up the majority of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hitting all the main, you know, points in there. But the thing that you really see they're driving home is, is what it, it goes back to, it says, without faith. It says, uh, without belief or without faith it is impossible. Verse 5 says, but without belief or faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to Elohim has to believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. So it's one of those things where it's like when God's trying to do something in our lives and it makes me wonder how the Father is reacting to us when we have unbelief, when we don't, we're not walking in faith where he's clearly said, hey, by the way, this is what I need you to do. And you go, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> well, I'm not asking you to do it, but I'm going to do that through you. Yeah, but I can't. I'm not a good speaker. Well, I didn't ask you to be a good speaker. I'm asking you just to be obedient in what I actually called you to do. Right. Or if I need you to step out in faith in some way, that's going to stretch you. Like Nick was saying earlier, God's going to ask him to do something that he isn't good at. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's going to make us rely on him. You know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, when you look at it from a surface level, why Abraham would take his only son, the one guy that you said, God, you already promised me. Sarah even laughed at one point. He's like, I'm an old lady. But now am I going to bear a child now at my old age? He's like, all of this. And it comes down to now you want me to kill my son. Some people might have said, you, you, I can't be hearing from this. This can, clearly cannot be God. Hmm. But it doesn't say that. It says that Abraham even believed that he would be raised from the dead. Then, then verse 19, reckoning that Elohim was able to erase even from the dead from which he received him back as a type. So in our journey with our Heavenly Father, we have to, sometimes we're going to have to take that, what we call, quote unquote, that leap of faith mm -hmm. or step out of our comfort zone mm -hmm. or whatever that looks like for you. You know, for me and my journey, for me and my wife and my family, you know, it started uh, back in 2014. I knew I was going to have to leave my job. And you know, I had to step out in faith because I didn't have any other jobs. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Well, like anything else is lining up for me, God's like, this is what you're going to do. But I could tell you this through the whole process. One of the things that I've, I've been saying even more in the last couple of years is, God, I trust your plans. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand this, but I trust the, I, I know you have plans and I trust your plans. Mm -hmm. All the way to buying this property. And this property coming available when nobody else was going to, nobody was seeing this property but me. Everything that happened to, to be where we are was like, God, I don't know how this is going to happen, but I trust your time and I trust your plans. And so that's when we're walking out our faith. It's like, God, I don't, I don't, and it's, you know, it's, it's okay that we don't understand something sometimes. It's okay if it doesn't make sense when God tells you to leave your job and everybody else, like, you're dumb. You make good money. Why are you leaving that job where God told me to? Well, I don't think you're listening to God. I don't think that's God. And then the doubters come in. 
And that's another thing in the world we live in. Be careful who you share your dreams with. Be careful who you share your visions with. Be careful uh, how, when God speaks to you, who how many people you share that with, because you're always going to have those who aren't walking in faith. They're going to walk in their own ability, and they can't see past that in your life. They can't believe it. Well, Ryan, I wouldn't leave that job. You make good money. I wouldn't do that, or I wouldn't, whatever it is. I wouldn't do that, Ryan, because what they're doing is they're speaking from their own inadequacies in their life, and they're trying to place them upon you because they're not walking in the place of going, hey, you know what? I trust God. And I trust that you're going to do the right thing. So, hey, man, go for it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's good stuff. And they could yeah. have even thrown, or somebody could have thrown even scripture at you to say, well, Oh, absolutely. About the scripture that says to provide for your family and yada, yada, yada. Like, wouldn't you be, you know, going against some of those scriptures? And I'll be been, like, if God's called me God to do it, gonna God's going to provide. He, right. And God has provided every step of the way for the last nine years for this ministry. Yep. That's why I don't sweat it. God, this is just as yours. This all belongs to you. And it's your timing. When you're ready for things to happen, it will happen. And that's and I'm gonna be honest with you. That's a great place to be walking in because you walk with so much less stress in your life, worrying about every little thing. Well, what about this or what about that? No, no, no. Mm-hmm. if God's called us to do it, He says, "I will." Look, when the people came out of Egypt, did He not provide everything they would ever need? Right. Matter of fact, He gave them more than what they needed because they had to tell. Oh, can you imagine having so much gold? You're telling people to. Stop the gold, please. <laughs> Stop all the silver and gold. We got enough. Oh, I don't need any more of the fine linens and all the, the tapestries. No, we're good. Everybody, I, I appreciate everybody's heart, but we, we have enough. They didn't have to go out there and kill themselves working a job or plowing fields to get all that. Matter of fact, God says, I'm going to give you homes you didn't build, fields you didn't plow. I'm going to give you land that you never even had to do anything to. And when you walk into that promised land, It'll literally be flowing with milk and honey. And that's why I really love this chapter too, because it's not, it's kind of like that nice break and everything. It's that encouraging chapter where it's like, hey, it's by belief. Even if it didn't make sense, even though Sarah laughed, even though whatever, even though Noah's getting ridiculed, building a boat out, a boat out in the middle of the desert, not just a boat, but a freight liner <laughs> in the middle of the desert. And he's preaching repentance the entire time while he's doing all this. God provided for all the wood, the material, and the ability to make everything happen. And he protected him. And he protected him through yeah. it also. That's a really good point. <laughs> I'm sure it took him a long time to build that boat. I'm sure people knew about it. But then you see the movie, the, the fallen angels came and built it for him. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> like it was like this, right? There you go. Oh, anyway. That's why I, I really enjoy this chapter because I think it's a nice break in the just the, in this particular study about the priestly hood and everything. Is by the way, let's just take a moment to, to to look at what faith is or what belief is, right? And that we're not even to this point in this writing of Hebrews unless these people are walking in what they need to be walking in. Exactly. Because again, all it takes is a thread way back over there to come unraveled, and we don't have this. All it takes is someone not walking in obedience, and it's a different story being written. Yeah, Moses not coming before the Father multiple times to save Israel. You know. Right. What if Moses just went, went I'm not going to do it. I'm, mm-hmm. I don't care. I can't speak right, blah, blah. You know, but thankfully, Moses did shift in that direction. Mm-hmm. And so, again, without certain things happening and the Father scan being in it, we're not here. We're not sitting here. We don't have all these uh lovely people online with us our family online with us having these conversations together and it's all through faith and belief that we all get to this point right now amen yeah, and, and I, th- I think just to make this last point yeah uh, yeah yep. to make this last point in 26 it says he by my moses considered the reproach of christ greater wealth than the treasures of egypt so it's, it's essentially telling us even back then moses is already future-minded saying this stuff is stuff I need to be prepared, focused, and thinking about the future people. Mm-hmm. He's, you know, I, I don't know how big brain Moses was or how much God, you know, let him see into the future. You know, he says he was able to see essentially east, west, left, up, down, left, right, you know, and see that the sands of the sea and all this other stuff. So when he went to the top of the mountain before he died, he, Moses very easily could have seen this group of people right here reading scriptures being like, ah, those guys. These these are going to be my future family. These are going to be the guys that we're all going to be together in the kingdom with. 
how often do we take that approach to, you know, to life when we interact with people and whenever we're involved with people, you know, we see the Passover. This the Hebrews is written well after Yeshua's died and resurrected. It's still speaking highly of the Passover and how that was an integral part of the story of the Moses who literally said he considered the reproach of Christ. So we know that these things are important for our lives to follow his ways, to stay in a position of righteousness with the Father as we've kind of gone through this whole study today. And for us to remember that our impact is almost unending. We don't even know how big of an impact we get to have in the world. And we can only go up. We can't go down, right? Unless, unless it's our own choosing. So, you know, let's honor Christ. Let's honor the Father and say, use me. I'll go. Yes, sir. Whatever it, whatever it is. And not try to, like we talked about earlier, command the Holy Spirit to do weird walking stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not a weird side thought where we get up to the new kingdom and we get up into heaven and all these people we've read about, they just show up and you're, you're meeting them and it's like, oh, this is Moses. And then they look at you and they're like, no, you're of my line. And mm -hmm. you're just like, no, I'm not mm -hmm. South Carolina. No, you're like my great exponential grandson exactly. or granddaughter. And you're just like, what? <laughs> That's cool. I like to read that I will be literally the mixed multitude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Awesome. All right, guys. I appreciate it. I'm trying to get everybody's comments in here. Um, but we're getting ready to go ahead and close it out. Enjoy the study today. Enjoy everybody with us. Again, we're going to be uh, going into the sermon here in about five-ish, as always. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the spirit of Elijah versus the spirit of Ahab. So let the fight begin. Fight! Yep. Yeah. So anyway, let's see. What we got uh, we got a discussion of cookies in here. <laughs> yeah, bring them. Yeah, it was extensive. Chocolate, salt, and caramel. Bible, yummy. No, no, no. Cookies. Yeah, let's talk about cookies, man. <laughs> Y'all making me hungry. That's why I'm glad we're breaking for a little bit of food right now. <laughs> the phrase "the long game" is that an accurate phrase, or am I miss? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I take it. No, yeah, I'll take it too. It's definitely like that God, what God has called us to do. We are to play the longest game right. of mm -hmm. our entire lives. From the garden. Right. Yep. You'll, you'll, you'll bruise his heel, but you'll bruise his head. From the garden, he had a plan. He's like, oh, Satan, you're going to win a little bit. I'm thinking of the millennium. You're thinking of 6,000, 7,000 years. <laughs> sure. Good job, buddy. Yeah. But even in our, you know, whatever years of life that we get, our whole life is supposed to be like the long game. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to the future, looking forward to the promises, and not being just all wrapped up in our earthly time. Correct. Yeah, man. Uh, and we have. Um, hope you say your name correctly. Is it uh, Shamona? Listening and blessed from Nairobi, Kenya. Good. Shamrana. Shamrana. Sean. Moana. Moana. Sure. Okay. I don't know. I'm just asking, man. <laughs> But uh, anyway, uh, blessed to have you on. Thank you for listening uh, to us today, being a part of our study. Love everybody. Um, Caleb is making an early dinner right now, so we're going to be eating soon, too. Oh, man. It's feast day. That's right. All right, guys. Good to uh, see everybody on here. Thank you for joining us. And uh, if you missed any of it, please go back and listen to us. Good study today. Really enjoyed it. Again, I love how God's word from the Old Testament to the new to the old to the new testament everything we've been reading all just seems to keep lining up with one another and just moving in that direction so mm -hmm. if you guys can join us back here about five ish uh we'll have our sermon today and we'll be wrapping it up for uh the shabbat day so blessings to you all jonathan yeah all right let's pray Joe, thank you for this day thank you for um, all the scriptures that were read today thank you that we have bibles that are translated in english as best as they are I uh, thank you for this country where we get to read it freely and discuss it over the internet uh, with all of you guys. I just thank you for all the patriarchs, Lord, for their for their willingness to follow you by faith and to walk this walk out perfectly or in, in the way that you prescribed them to, that all the way till today their impact is still being fed. And I just felt and I just pray that as we continue um, in our journeys and our walks that we we look and strive to be like these men and women of old. I said thank you for who you are and who you continue to be. And thank you so much for your son, Yeshua. Praise things in his name. Amen. 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 All right. Shalom, everybody. Uh, so we're going to pray for Joanne uh, Willer real quick. She says, uh, send a prayer for my husband. He broke down offshore in a boat waiting for assistance. 
So, Father, we lift up uh, Joanne's husband, and we ask, Father, that you be with him, uh, keep him protected. We thank you that he was able to contact someone to uh, come and, and uh, uh, get him, and we just pray that uh, for your very best for him and just your blessings and to re return home safely, Father. We thank you for that in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Shalom to everybody. God bless, Shalom. and we'll see some of y'all here in just a little bit. Ah. Uh -huh.